Hey, this is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This show is a special episode that I do each month with my wife, Adi Cashew, owner of Working Against Gravity. Adi and her company have worked with over 15,000 people, helping them transform their lives by dialing in their nutrition. We started this special show because the first few podcasts that I did with Adi were some of the most popular I'd ever done, and nutrition in general is probably the most popular topic that we discuss on the show. So each month we talk about things like how to be consistent on your diet, how to be more accurate. We talk about goal setting, nutrient timing, and so much more. Enjoy the show. And I'm back with my favorite podcast host ever. Adi. Uh, guest, not host. Did I say host? You just said host. Oh, I'm my favorite host. You're my favorite <laughs> guest. You're my favorite host too. So it's January. Everybody's super pumped up about the new year, all of their goals for the year, their vision for the year. You and I have been talking about it a lot. We've been writing about it, talking about it. And WAG just put out a goal setting guide. So before we get into what you believe about goal setting, can you talk a little bit about how most people do it wrong and why? I think you told me the stat yesterday that only 8% of people actually accomplish their goals. Yeah, only 8% of people actually follow through on their New Year's resolutions. So why are 92% of people failing? Um, I think after seeing... I mean, part of the process at Working Against Gravity is to set your goals at the beginning of working with us and seeing the way that people are doing that over so many different people, so much time, you notice a couple patterns of what people might be doing not so efficiently or effectively. And we've noticed three pretty much big things that people are doing. One is that they're setting unrealistic goals, like goals that are like entirely out of reach or just not having like a real understanding of what it requires to achieve that kind of goal. So they're just setting this arbitrary goal that seems super glamorous. Like, you know, I want to be competitive in Ironman competitions while looking like Brooke Entz. And those goals are like very conflicting. So it's, it's, I would say, I would deep, would you say it's impossible to, to have both of those at the same time? Pretty damn close. Yeah, it would be pretty damn close to impossible. So people are setting goals like that. Or, you know, I want to make the CrossFit Games this year and they just started doing CrossFit and have never been any type of athlete before. Like those are just just completely unrealistic. Like don't have any understanding of what that goal actually entails. And I think that's a huge problem when people are setting goals. And then also they're setting only one kind of goal, which I'm we're going to talk about in a second, different kinds of goals. And it's also outlined in that worksheet on the website. Um, and the one kind of goal is they're only setting an outcome-based goal. So that means I'm going to lose 20 pounds or I'm going to 10x my income and whatever it is, uh, it could be realistic and it could be something that you can achieve, but it's really far out in the future. So it's really hard to be connected to that every single day and keeping you connected to doing the work that it requires to actually get that that goal accomplished. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not something you notice. Like that's why I don't think – most people obviously set a New Year's resolution with the intention of actually accomplishing it. It's really subtle the ways that you become disconnected from that goal and and not actually putting in the work that you were putting in at the beginning. And it's not something so obvious. So that's why only setting the outcome goal, it's really easy to get off track and not even notice because that goal is so far in the future that you're like not even – there's no – you're not keeping up with it. You're not keeping track. So there's – not other kinds of goals, like we're going to talk about process goals or sub goals or small goals on the way that help keep you on track. And if you only have an outcome-based goal, um, it's easy to get off track with that. Right. It, it seems like saying like, I want to go to Paris, but you don't have like a map of how to get there. You know, like the general direction you need to go and you can, you can definitely get closer, but you could also get lost yeah. and then just give up exactly. on, on, on like, going I'm never to Paris. Gonna, I'm never going to get there. Right. I think it's a, I don't think people are, I don't think this is an issue of people being lazy or anything like that. I totally. think it's just a, a lack of awareness that mm -hmm. 
when when you set those big goals, then you have to you have to backtrack. You have to reverse engineer what it's going to take right. you to get and there. And I think th- that you're setting those big outcome goals at a time that motivation's super high. And like this time of year, you can't imagine not being motivated. Like you're so motivated right now, you're like, of course I'm going to get this goal done because everything like the holidays just passed i'm ready to be back in my routine like how many times i've heard since the holidays like i'm so ready to eat healthy i'm so ready to start working out again i'm so Mm -hmm. ready to get back into my routine but that happens every holiday season so eventually like that motivation lowers life happens you you get back into the stress and the regular things that happen in your life so right now you're set only setting the outcome goal seems realistic like I'm soup I feel super strongly towards it and eventually that starts to fade and then you don't even notice that you're not as motivated towards it anymore. So mm-hmm. I think people don't put the 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 pieces in place that like the that the, are going to be the obstacles that they're going to hit but you're not facing right now. Right. So you're not facing that lack of motivation right now. You're not facing that getting off track right now. So you're like I mean when I'm on track and feeling 100 like a million bucks I'm like I'm I used to even say to you, like, isn't it awesome that I'm always going to be this way? Like, mm-hmm. that, there's no way I could be any any other way. Like, I can't even imagine going back to my old ways. But it happens somehow and you don't even realize it. Right. I love how uh, Justin Sua talks about the importance of being connected to your purpose as well. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel and I think a lot of people around this time of year, you know, they they just spend a lot of time with family, a lot of them um, with loved ones, with friends, like really being kind of introspective and, and reminding themselves like what really matters. Mm-hmm. And then you have this, you know, couple that with the new year, kind of like a new opportunity for growth. And it's like, you, you can be really connected with why things are important to you. And then everything is easier, right? For sure. So Justin talked about it, like, a, say, a professional baseball player, um, you know, take like hitting off the tee, as mundane as that is, when you can connect that to your deeper purpose of wanting to be the best at your craft, it's not mundane anymore. It's like just a part of it. It's easy. Right. You know, um, all those little things become so effortless when you're connected to your purpose. Totally. So let's help people really capitalize on this momentum that they have Mm -hmm. by giving them the roadmap that, um, you give out in the WAG guide. So Break it down for us. What is the right way to do goal setting? So the, I mean, you were a huge part in writing that guide too, so you can speak to it as well. Uh, the right way to set goals is going to be just not just set an outcome goal, but kind of reverse engineer it and do two other What kinds. is an outcome goal, by the way? So an outcome goal would be like where your end state is. Like what's the end in the future? So it could be losing 20 pounds. It could be... 10xing your income it could be winning the crossfit games it could be hitting a pr and snatch and clean and jerk whatever it is it's something that's a little bit outside of your control it's this outcome that you really want you can't really control whether you can lose 20 pounds or not i mean there are certain factors that might come into play that are just completely outside of your control that stop you from achieving that but it's this glamorous end state that you're striving for um that would be an outcome goal love it and then and to set a great to a good process for goal setting would be also to set what I would call short-term micro goals and process goals. And those are two different things. So process goals is the behab- the habits and the behaviors that you're going to participate in every day or every week or whatever it is. Like I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to do whatever my coach tells me to do. I'm going to um, eat eat be on top of my nutrition i'm going to meditate i'm going to do like just the general behaviors and habits that you're going to put into place that help you achieve your goal like what are the mindsets attitudes behaviors strategies i need to put into a place to achieve that outcome goal so it's like a little bit taking a step back being like if i want to win the crossfit games what are those behavior strategies habits i need to have in order to achieve that And then your short-term micro goals are going to be short periods of time and similar to outcome goals are going to be actually things that you can achieve, but in shorter periods of time. So you feel that success on the way to the outcome goal. Because a lot of times that outcome goal is super far that you don't, it's like a little bit defeating, like, am I ever going to see success, you know? So setting short-term micro goals on the way, like maybe even for the next hour, like in the next hour, I'm going to finish this bottle of water. Or 
in the next two days, I'm going to make sure I do one Mm Ramwad in the next two Mm -hmm. days. Like, and then once you've done that, you have this little sense of achievement. Like I have integrity with myself. I'm following through on the things that I said I was going to follow through on. And it's setting little goals for yourself along the way so that you can stay motivated and succeed. I love that. I I, I use this example all the time that coach Nick Saban, the uh, Alabama head football coach, Mm -hmm. probably the best college football coach of all time they never talk about winning a championship they all all they talk about is the process that it takes to get to winning winning a championship right so in in that sense i i firmly believe that just setting the big goals like where do i want to be in a year or five years just doing that is is a you you have very low probability of succeeding for sure right couple that with process and those sub goals to build some momentum and you have a much higher yeah higher well, rate of success. I think we talked about this yesterday that an outcome goal without the process and sub goals is highly likely that you're not going to succeed. Mm-hmm. But process and sub goals without an outcome goal, you can still succeed. Right. Like you can it doesn't go the other way around. Like if you just have process goals like strategies and behaviors to be the kind of person you want to be and sub goals like small achievable things that you can handle in a short period of time you're going to make progress with just those mm-hmm. but with just the outcome goal and not the other things it's going to be way harder for you to succeed unless you're like a unicorn that just happens to do those things without even paying attention to them right okay let's go through because all of this is like a little bit abstract right so can you break down this goal for me okay. using those so <laughs> i want to get a six pack by the end uh i want to get a six pack in six, six months that's my big outcome goal okay N- what uh, now what okay so first if you go if you download our works our worksheet i'm not i don't have it in front of me so i don't remember exactly what's on it but i'm pretty but it's sure it's on it the top about, of you can get it at workingagainstgravity.com at the very the top. top of the yeah. page it's at the very top of the home page uh and on that worksheet it talks about the it talks about the why So I would first suggest talking about why you want to do that. So that's really what you just talked about, connecting to the purpose of why you're even doing this. But not just ask yourself why one time, ask yourself why like multiple times. So my question to you would be, why do you want to get a six pack? Because ladies think it's sexy. Okay. And then- One lady in particular. (laughs) And then you'd ask yourself why again, and you have to give a different reason why. Because I feel more confident when I'm leaner. Okay. And now ask yourself why one more time. Because I I always grew up thinking that lean. That's a good that's a good one. Mm. I always grew up thinking that I mean, I could help you. Like uh, with maybe. Uh, with this idea of like, I don't know, what's the What's that? What's the that concept of like the perfect man? You know what I'm talking about? Like the like arms wide. Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah, like that. Like just idolizing, kind of that warrior physique. Right. So you want that warrior physique. Mm-hmm. Right. So then now you have like all of these reasons, three different reasons why you want to achieve this goal, and then now the best way would be to ask you like what would be the habits and strategies or the process goals that you'd need to have in order to achieve a six pack. And I can help you out if you need help. Okay. So what am I doing first? I'm, I'm laying process down the process. Goals. So the process, um, let's see. First, I simply need to weigh and measure my food because I know that when I weigh and measure, I'm immediately – more consistent with the amount of calories and macronutrients that I'm eating. Perfect. Number two for me is I'm going to focus on eating to 80%. No, 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 no. If I'm tracking, that's that's not a that's not one. I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on eating mindfully and f- really being present at every single meal. Okay. Because when I'm not, I know that I get really hungry and that that kind of snowballs into me like going off my diet. Right. Those and, are the two things. Okay. So those will be two things, two process goals that you have for yourself. Mm-hmm. And then what is maybe some short term or sub goals that would also enhance that process? So it could be like checking in with a coach, could mm-hmm. be weighing in every single day. It could be maybe uh, your goal would be to be within five or 10 grams of your macro targets each day. 
Uh, it could be getting to the gym three times this week. Like those are just a bunch of different options of short term or micro goals that would get you closer to your outcome. But it's really just focusing on what you can do today or right. this week or within the next hour. Today, yeah, I'm going to focus on getting hitting in between those those numbers um, on my macros today, mm -hmm. and I will. I'm going to I'm going to commit to weighing myself every single day. And those are perfect. And that's just like even if it's not everything and it's not all the goals at once, it's just another step closer to where you want to be. And it's motivating because you don't you're not overwhelmed by having to do so much at the same time. And I know there's probably people listening to this right now that are like this is so simple. You know, like this is so basic. It is this, so simple. This and basic. is <laughs> so simple and basic, but the simple and basic things are the hardest things because you take it for granted. Mm -hmm. You take it for granted. You're like, oh, that's so simple. Like, I'm such a complex human. Like, I'm more advanced than this. But 92% of people are not achieving their New Year's resolutions. Right. So it is so simple, but 92% of people aren't doing it. So, I mean, you're likely part of that 92%. Right. I, I think it's, I think the setting the outcome goals is just really, really fun, yeah, right? We love to visualize ourselves at that end state, right? Yeah. Having the six pack or the bigger business or the- And you do want you know, to have those. Accomplishment, right? We, 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 we love those. And the research shows that that part is super, super motivating mm -hmm. and it can contribute to success only when paired with the other stuff. Right, exactly. And it, in that goal setting worksheet, it also explains all that research. Like it brings up that research, gives you more other kinds of goals, like instructor goals and different different goals that we're not talking about here, but uh, it gives you a little bit of background on the actual Are you research. You talking about actual science? Yeah, the actual oh, science. Shit. <laughs> it has the citations for you to read the studies if you want. So I love how <laughs> you guys you help people identify potential obstacles and then help them overcome the obstacles before mm -hmm. they even happen. How do you do that? It's it's kind of like what I just did with you here, like asking questions, helping people be more introspective and be more self-aware. I think a lot of people think they want someone else to tell them what to do, but really the most effective way to get you to change is for you to tell yourself mm -hmm. and for you to know to come up with those actions and behaviors yourself. Like we all have been in those situations where someone tells us what to do and we just resist just because they told us what to do mm -hmm. like for no better reason than I don't want to be told what to do. So we try and help people come up with their own obstacles themselves. Like what potential obstacles do you imagine facing that could hinder you from achieving your goals. And that might be, I have three kids and we have a snack box in the cupboard and that's tempting to me. And then when they come up with that obstacle, we can guide them to coming up with some strategies on how to effectively manage that particular obstacle. But I can't really tell people what obstacles they're going to face because really it's like shooting fish in a barrel, right? Like I might get the right obstacle, but I'm not living your life. Like right. I'm the expert on nutrition, behaviors, habits, but I'm not the expert on you. Like you're the expert on you. Mm -hmm. So it's really about you becoming more aware of your lifestyle and your surroundings and understanding the little habits that you have around food. And I know like 8 million different habits that people have around food. Not everybody has them all. Right. So it's really just about asking questions and getting people to reflect. And just by inputting your data, sometimes you notice things that you didn't even notice before. That's without a doubt the best approach. Like me, you, you know, very well, if someone tells me what to do and I haven't asked, I have this immediate response, like either in my head or, or mm -hmm. outwardly that I already know that I didn't need, you know, you didn't need to tell me that I already, I already know that. Right. And then I just kind of discount it. Um, a lot of times without even knowing it. But everyone has that. So like everyone has goals that they have that the word is ambivalent, like you're ambivalent about. So you have equally as many reasons to want to change, equally as many reasons to not want to change. And we all have those things. That's why we don't achieve because we stay in the middle. We stay ambivalent. Mm -hmm. Like we want to change, but we don't want to change. And we we can't push to one side or the other. So if someone comes up to you, let's say you're an alcoholic and like, you know, every alcoholic knows what they're doing is not good for them. Like they're still choosing to do it anyways. They have just as many reasons to want to drink as just, I mean, you could speak to this better than me, but they have just as many reasons to want to continue drinking as to stop drinking. And so they just, they don't know, they're just ambivalent about it. And if someone goes up to an alcoholic and is like, 
you need to stop doing this. This is bad for your health. Like you're going to end up with liver cirrhosis. They know that already. So immediately you're speaking to that one side of reasons to change. They're going to go and defend the other side. It's like, oh, I have this other side too. I'm going to defend it. Like you're not even respecting that this other side exists. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to be like, no, 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 no. I don't have a problem. I can stop whenever I want to. When like you'd hope that the reaction is like, oh my gosh, you're right. This is bad for me. Mm -hmm. But like they already know. Like everyone listening already knows all the reasons you should change and all the reasons you shouldn't change. It's just about you deciding that you want to change. And we try and help people make that choice. Right. So this this whole goal setting process is kind of set up to build integrity with yourself and, and be like motivating, right? You you mm -hmm. accomplish these sub goals, you get a little squirt of of progress motivation, juice. progress <laughs> juice, as you call it. And then you can make a little bit bigger one, but mm -hmm. also a, a little sub goal. And it's all about like building momentum, keeping that motivation high. Right. What happens when the motivation is just not there, right? I don't, I don't know a single person, elite athlete, CEO, you know, high achiever at all that is always highly motivated. So yeah. what, do, what do they do? What do, how do you, how do you get through it? So I think that one thing that these, I mean, after having worked to so many different elite level people, um, athletes, high achievers, and seeing the way that they behave in like, we're working in an industry that requires motivation at certain points or like pushing through that sticking point that you're talking about is they continue, they stay in action for as long as possible just because they've made this commitment to themselves. And a lot of times they're not motivated and a lot of times they fall off track, but they still check in every single week. They are vulnerable. They talk about what they're going through and they still stay in action even though they don't want to. Like they do the things they want they want to do but don't want to do at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to go to the gym but also don't want to go to the gym. So they're doing those things anyways, even when motivation's not there. And that's like so much easier said than done. So there are like little hacks that you can bring into your life that can help stoke your motivation for action because these elite athletes are not necessarily the best to compare yourself to because they're they're definitely a little bit different. They're a different breed. Like they're going to stay in action even when motivation's not there. That's part of being a professional in anything, right? Right. But you can be a professional showing in your own up. life. Exactly. Like Just showing up no yeah. matter what. I think that's the biggest, one of the biggest lessons I learned in 2017 is like how human these athletes are mm -hmm. and they're just like all of us. And there's no reason every single one of us can't treat our lives the way that they treat their lives. Like just because Katrin Davis daughter won the CrossFit games doesn't mean I should treat my life differently than she treats her life. Mm -hmm. Like I can also be just as professional as she is in terms of my life. Like I'm a professional version of myself and I can treat my life that way. And every single person listening to this can treat their life that way. And you deserve to treat your life that way. Right. You do. In your relationships, in your career, Everything. in your sport, every single mm -hmm. thing you do, there's no reason that you have to slack off or not give it your full effort. Right. And I think that the excuse a lot of people make is like they're different than me. And I think that's an easy, it's an easy out. Like you're giving yourself an easy out. Like she's not different than you. Like she's really not. Like I get an intimate view into these people's lives and they're just not different than you. They're exactly like you. They just are professionals. And there's just, I don't see any reason why we can't all be professionals. Mm -hmm. So it's just understanding that you are exactly like them and saying that, you know, they're just different or they're just like, I couldn't possibly be like them. They're a freak, like they're a unicorn, whatever it is. Uh, it's really just giving yourself an out when right. it's not the truth. It's not real. What's let, Let's go back and forth and share a couple of our other biggest lessons from 2017. What's, okay. a, what's another big one for you? Okay, cool. Um, well, we talk a lot. We've talked a lot over the most recent past about motivation, like different ways to hack motivation. And I, I do have a bunch of those. But one of my biggest lessons of 2017 has been um, – uh, this is like a vulnerable one, but I'll share it anyways. Go for it. Um, that we don't do vulnerability on this <laughs> podcast. I think I've talked about on different podcasts before that I have a hard time making friends and like especially female friends. And it's just I've always had a hard time kind of like I feel super awkward. And I think sometimes that can come across as me being rude 
or like me being intimidating. And I think my one of my biggest lessons of 2017 is um, I don't like my best friends I've immediately connected with. So like Taylor Mendez or Amy Everett, like the moment I met them, we had this like immediate connection that within five minutes, they were my best friend. Like that's just how our relationship went. But I have other really close relationships in my life right now that weren't like that. And I think that I had made this decision that like, if we weren't going to immediately connect, then we weren't going to be friends. And I understood this year that everyone's going through their own battle. And like, maybe I'm meeting someone on a bad day (laughs) and maybe they're just like, you know, I, I'm, I'm realizing it in myself. Like some days I'm just really awkward and self-conscious. And if that, that immediate connection happens with the specific personality type, and if they don't have that personality type, I might be like so awkward that we can't connect that way. And it's worth giving people a chance and continuing to be present with them and really just continuing to get to know people anyways, and not just passing judgment and really like getting up close. It's, uh, it's like the, Braving the Wilderness book, Mm -hmm. Braving the Wilderness with Brene Brown. She talks about like getting up close with people and how it's easy to hate people from far away. Like you categorize people into like being liberal or Republican or whatever it is. But if you really get up close with people and you get to know them, it's impossible to hate them. Like there's so much to relate to. So I think that's like one of the biggest lessons of 2017 is like don't pass judgment so quickly and if I don't connect immediately with somebody, that's right. okay. That's huge. I actually haven't heard you say that before. <laughs> I've definitely thought it. That's cool. That's a that's a huge realization. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Uh, one of my biggest ones is has to do with um, what is inside and outside of my control. So I've understood the I've understood the concept of what's what's in my control and outside of my control and that I shouldn't focus on what's outside of my control. I shouldn't worry about it. And this year I've really felt it and become aware of it in the moment a lot more. So I think, I think a big reason for this is because of being consistent with meditation. I'm able to observe my thoughts a little bit more and catch myself when I'm worried about you know, what someone else said about me or what, what someone is thinking about me or, or who's, if I'm better than someone or worse than someone, I'm not at, I'm much quicker to notice that. And when I notice it now, I can almost immediately let go of it. Right. When I know, when I notice and tell myself, I can't control that. Like I can't change that it immediately dissipates. And then I have the opportunity to direct my, I, to take action into something I can control. So right. if it's something, if it's something about in business about, you know, with brute that I'm worried about, like I'm worried that we're going to have a really bad month, right? Um, exactly how much money we make that month is outside of my control. What's inside of my control is the actions I take today to make us more successful. So yeah. worrying about how much I'm going to make doesn't, doesn't do me any good, doesn't do my relationships any good, the company any good, my internal well-being. But what does do good is a clear mind and directing my actions towards product productive things. Right. It's so easier said than done. That's going to have to be a continued practice. For, for sure. sure. That's like really cool one though. I like that. I need to do a little bit more of that. <laughs> G- give me another one of yours. Um. Another one of my biggest lessons in 2017 has been, I mean, just like we just talked about treating your life like a professional, that was a huge one, like treating my life like a professional, anywhere from like how I organize my closet to how I wake up in the morning, live throughout the day, thoughts I think, actions I take, that was a big one. I think the biggest one of all of them- Oh shit, write this down, guys. This is is the biggest one, drum roll. is that in any type of situation where I feel like wronged or some something negative is happening to me, happening to me or whatever it is, mm-hmm. I'm in a conflict with somebody or there's something going wrong, I have a piece in that. Like there's something in that situation that I'm accountable for. And even if I can't see it, there is something there that I'm accountable for, whether it was the way I approached a situation, the the things I said, thinking that thinking that it was a certain way, but this, the other person thought it was a different way. Like there's something I'm accountable for. So in any type of situation, 
It's going to always benefit me to take accountability, take accountability for my piece before t- before anything else, mm-hmm. like before having a conversation. And it's never going to benefit me to not take accountability and expect someone else to take accountability for their piece. I think that's like a recipe for ruining relationships and and extending arguments. Mm-hmm. And it's sometimes just worth it to push through that discomfort, even if I felt super wronged or if I felt like that person needed. To to like take accountability for their part, like that discomfort of taking accountability for your piece is is real. Yep. Like it is painful sometimes to be like, I'm just gonna take accountability for my piece. I'm gonna apologize for what I did, even if I don't even 100% agree with it. Mm-hmm. Like it's real to them. So in almost every situation, not every situation, but almost every situation, it's softened up that other person where they can respect you for hearing them out and understanding them and going pushing through that discomfort it's like crawling out of the depths of hell you Mm -hmm. know it's like actually physically painful sometimes to do that um and almost always it's it's helped me develop a better relationship with those people and Mm -hmm. get through conflict much easier and it's like it it really is it can be effortless when you do it that way right when you approach conflict that way i mean yeah like you come in and you you're like let's say it's you and me like we're upset with each other and i come up to you and i'm just like soften up and i'm and i just tell you like what piece i was accountable for in that situation you almost always are like so grateful that i did that like i was the hero in that situation and i um took accountability and you're just like ready to take accountability for your piece and we move through it so quickly right that's one of, that's actually one of the most valuable things I learned in AA, which is the, is step nine, making amends. I had like all of these resentments that I had built up over, over years with all of these people, but I had also, I had hurt them either in response to what they had done to me or, or nothing at all. Right. But I had, I had all these resentments. And so a, a huge part of me wanted to say, you know, I'm sorry for what I did, but you fucked up worse you know what i mean like like some version of that and that but is immediately negating everything that happens before the but so if you apologize and you're like but i apologized and then you had a but statement you've just negated your apology like the Mm -hmm. apology doesn't exist anymore like that person no longer hears the apology because you said but Mm -hmm. it totally negates everything before it and i like definitely encourage anybody who's listening who feels like you have some type of conflict with somebody like try and find a way to resolve it. And sometimes even if you can't see it, like take a second and forget the story about what that person did and think about what you might've done and like, what what's their perspective? Like, or maybe even just ask them like, Hey, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to argue with you, but I want to hear what this is like for you from your perspective. And maybe you might learn something mm-hmm. about the situation. Man, I have, I have so many, I have so many more, but I'll just give one more and then we can move on. Okay. Um, I actually had this, this popped into my head as I was about to get my hair cut last night. Mm-hmm. Um, it just like, you know how I, I talk about like the light shine, like a, the self-awareness light just shining on something you didn't realize. Right. Right. Like it, all of a sudden I had this huge realization that I'm for the past for like year, <laughs> I don't know if it's year or how long, okay. but I've been I haven't been as happy as I'm, as I'm used to being, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? And I, I, I don't know. I've tried lots of different things and I realized in, in one instant last night that I've been so, so focused on me. I've been, you know, on my own issues and work and feelings and everything just so Mm self-centered. I don't think that my actions have been have I have always been so self-centered but my my focus my you know in what's happening in my mind has definitely been very self-centered and again going back to my time in recovery like I know that's really a recipe for for disaster you know sure. uh, or at least just pain and and suffering basically uh it's just not a not a good place in there and I noticed, I think over maybe the last week, I've felt a little bit more focused on other people. It's as simple as just curious about how someone's doing or what can I, what can I contribute to someone right now? And that simple shift, and this, this, this goes into a bigger, a much bigger lesson that I learned this year, a simple shift of focusing on 
what I can do for others is life changing. Mm -hmm. Right. You and I did uh, a couple of the landmark courses this year. And that was that was probably my biggest lesson. I spent my whole life thinking about myself, like, what can I do to be happier and more fulfilled? All, you know, all the while just trying to have a better life. The way like what I what I learned is actually the way to have a better life is to focus on what you can do for other people. We're hardwired to contribute to other people. Yeah, I think that one of the biggest lessons you had, you've talked to me about it, about during that, especially the advanced course of the Landmark Forum, but that if you dedicate your life towards helping other people have the best life possible, you will automatically have the best life possible. So like, it's a hard thing to trust that, but trusting that and just helping other people live their best possible life, that reciprocity will just automatically come back and you will have the best life ever Mm -hmm. like just not focusing on your own a because they will want you to have the best life ever because you've contributed to theirs and then b because it feels so good to do good things for other people like it just feels incredible even with no recognition at all like just doing something there's so many times i do something for somebody else and i get no rec i mean being the ceo of a company is like you're the last person to get recognition right like you're always recognizing your employees and you're trying to be grateful and practice gratitude to them it doesn't matter like helping them live the best life possible automatically makes me live the best life possible hell yeah okay let's finish off here with a few questions that we got from some people on the social medias okay Okay, let's start with this. This is from these are these are Instagram posts. So at Cubby Actual, an absolute savage that one. <laughs> when looking at post workout nutrition, what are some good options for solid food carbohydrates versus drinking something like highly branched cyclic dr- dextrin? Say that five times fast. I understand drinking them is recommended as best, but wouldn't mind options for food I can eat slash taste post workout. And then part two is. Is there really that much of a trade-off by eating or drinking them? So food options post-workout. So food options post-workout, generally something that is going to absorb quickly. So having carbohydrates post-workout, anything higher on the glycemic index is going to be absorbed more quickly. And why is that? Why is the absorption, like the, the rate that it goes into the body important at all? So that you can use it. Um, for recovery. So you can start the recovery process as quickly as possible. And having protein as well is going to help because protein can help break down carbohydrates faster as well. So it can help you absorb that stuff quickly. And then limiting fat in that period, uh, fat can slow down uh, the digestion of things. So that's uh, going to be important. So any like it really, you want to stick to things that feel good for you. Uh, It's going to be different for every single person. So some people um, like white rice, it's going, it's, that works well after a workout. Some people like oatmeal, some people like, um, higher glycemic fruit, like pineapple or banana or things like that. Uh, sweet potatoes be good. Sweet potatoes. <laughs> you just did like a pump. <laughs> um, so yeah, those things are, those things, it, it's really about what works for you, but those are some solid foods that I've seen work really well for people post-workout. And then Probably some source of like lean meat, right? I don't know if you said that already, but I just said for protein. protein. Got it. Could be lean meat. I mean, it could be. He talked Cottage about not drinking even? things, but it could be. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know how well dairy is going to sit post workout, but true that. Uh, but some people would do like a shake with a banana and protein powder, mm-hmm. like a whey protein powder, because whey is going to absorb faster as well. So uh, versus casein, um, but those are some good options post workout. I I usually tell people to like, unless you're, if you're doing multiple sessions in a day, then it's, then it's probably important to get, to get that food in, to get that, uh, replenish your muscle glycogen, get those carbohydrates into your bloodstream as quickly as possible so that you can perform optimally for your PM workout. Mm -hmm. But if you're not working out until the next day, as far as I know, the research, the research doesn't really point to you needing to drink your drink your food basically it's you you're, you're going to be recovered by the next day right i think it dip, it like i mean there's research that can go in either direction i don't think any there's like any like significantly strong 
evidence pointing in either direction, but getting in replenishing your glycogen is important. And for a lot of people that drink their carbohydrates, the problem that I've seen is that they just get hungry. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're often having too many carbohydrates in that shake. And you're just not going to be as full from drinking something versus actually physically eating something and that like sitting in your stomach. And also just the mindfulness around chugging down a drink versus sitting down at a table and eating a meal that also is going to have a factor on your hunger and that often can lead to overconsumption of food in general so then therefore you can put on body fat and not be heading towards your goals which of course like you could still be performing well but um it could cause some weight gain or some other things that you don't want to be happening number two at antenna z to heaven What's the science behind increasing carbs to lose weight as so many athletes claim? Does this only work for athletes that perform at a certain intensity every day? So I think the first statement is is just a little confusing to me that the athletes claiming to eat higher carbs to lose weight. So I don't I think there might be like a little bit of a misunderstanding on that. Uh, I think there are a lot of athletes that are openly talking about eating more carbohydrates after, you know, there was this huge like craze of um, paleo and um, not eating any carbs at all. So um, I think there's more athletes that are openly talking about the fact that they've been eating carbohydrates in in, in order to enhance their performance. But I don't think there's people saying that they're eating more carbohydrates for the purposes of losing weight. I think that that's maybe a little bit of a misunderstanding there. So what's, yeah, I guess what's really happening is that they, they are eating more carbohydrates than they're used to and they're losing weight. So why is that? So I think that a lot of these athletes that you're talking about are being more consistent and mindful of their nutrition in general. So they're being, they're tracking their food intake. So they're having the same amount of food intake every day. They're tracking their body weight and they're making adjustments based on how their body's reacting. So if their body's gaining weight, they're lowering things down and it's not always just lowering down carbohydrates or fats or protein. It's, it's different depending on who it is. And that's what's happening. It's just the consistency, the awareness around their food. Whereas often I bet people that weren't doing that were having this really, really hard training day and they're eating like a tremendous amount of food. And then have you ever eaten a ton of food and the next day you're like kind of still full from the day before? So then you just don't eat nearly like even close to as much as the day before. So overall your balance by the end of the week, like your caloric deficit or surplus evens out. And now they're just being a lot more purposeful about knowing what's going to their body, understanding which what foods that they're eating. And maybe they were eating carbohydrates before, but it wasn't just as consistently every day. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think that people are getting more aware of what they're putting in their body in general. Right. They're, and they're probably eating slightly less calories overall. I mean, mm-hmm. the uh, a paleo diet tends to have a lot more fat, which is higher calorie. And it's just way easier to to end up eating higher calories without even knowing it. Right. So they're not Which in, there's nothing wrong with that. To right, totally. Honest. Yeah. I'm not totally. saying we're just talking wrong. yeah, we're yeah. just talking about what's what's going on there, right? Mm-hmm. Cool. And to the high high intensity question, yeah. Um for a lot of these athletes that are competing in high intensity training and they're they're competitive sport is high intensity, then those carbohydrates are helping them perform best in the gym for sure. I think she said though, does this only work for athletes that perform at a high, at a certain intensity every day? So no, it doesn't. So then my answer would be, it doesn't only work for athletes, like uh, regular people that don't train that high intensity can eat carbohydrates, but you're definitely not going to eat as much. Like the ratio, I would definitely say you're going to eat lower amounts of carbohydrates and your fat intake might be a little bit higher. Like the, the ratio might change for, you know, me Mm -hmm. versus Catherine David's daughter. Like she's definitely eating more carbohydrates than me for sure. Like without a doubt, she's eating more carbohydrates than Mm me. Um, so I think that there's like a yes and a no to that. Like uh, the average person can still eat carbohydrates and lose weight, but can you eat in excess? No. If you eat in excess of any of the macronutrients, if you eat in excess of fat, you're also not going to lose weight. Mm-hmm. If you eat in excess of protein, you are also not going to lose weight. You just don't often find people that get fat from eating too much protein. That's right. just like not as common. Yeah. Okay. Next at Rando Andal. 
My biggest challenge is finding time to eat a healthy, fulfilling breakfast going from a wad to work first thing in the morning. Ooh, this is good. This is right up your alley. Yeah, this is like my favorite kind of conversation. There's just so many options for you. So I'm not sure what you like and what you don't like. If you like dairy, if dairy works for you, if you have any intolerances to gluten um, or eggs. Uh, but you, the key for you is going to be to try to at least prep a couple different things and see what fits well. So that could be like portioning out some nuts um, or some – cottage cheese and fruit or creating there's a lot of if you google overnight oats that kind of stuff is like super easy to just put in a mason jar and put in your fridge overnight and then you just grab that and it's just like a really easy thing to grab and it's already done i would still encourage you to sit and eat whatever meal that is and not just like eat it in the car on the go you do have time i promise you you Make have the time. time like Make you the have time. five or ten minutes to sit it doesn't i mean I've, I've thought Michael and I's meals were going to take so long and then like 15 minutes later, we're like done. But you have the time, make the time. Uh, but pre preparing as much in advance as possible. So having fruit that's already cut up so you don't have to cut it up yourself. Um, having overnight oats, having hard boiled eggs, like make a whole batch of hard boiled eggs so you can eat hard boiled eggs. Having, uh, I like those like little Greek yogurts, like the little, like they're already prepackaged for you. So that can work as well. So maybe you can have like a rice cake with some Greek yogurt on top of it. Uh, if you want to have some t like pre-make a turkey sandwich, if a turkey sandwich is what's going to make you feel good, uh, just have it ready to go the night before mm -hmm. and then there's no excuse. Right. Bottom line is prepare. Now th those are some great food options, but Rando Andal, I'm about to blow your mind. What? This is my favorite breakfast and it's very well balanced. I actually made it today. Go yeah, it takes time. Yeah, but, but the night before. Oh, you can the night make before. It yeah, that's it. Oh yeah, God, I would love to wake up and that's already done. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that t tonight. Okay. <laughs> so a little bit of bacon, maybe two pieces, chop it up, uh, fry that up, and then put in some sweet potatoes and some Brussels sprouts, mm -hmm. saute all of that. I like how you're participating in this. Mm -hmm. Make sure, like you, make, like sure that the, <laughs> make sure that the sweet potato gets soft. You got to make it all soft. Maybe <laughs> throw in a little onion and bell pepper and then throw in some egg whites into the same pan. Cook all that up. If you want, you can throw in a little bit of cheese if you do cheese. If not, you don't have to. Right. And then I highly recommend Cajun seasoning and hot sauce. Yeah. And you that can do- That is an amazing breakfast. You could- Switch that up too. It's kind of like a leftovers omelet, right? But you so, really, you never need to. You can just eat that every day. Right, <laughs> you can. <laughs> Sometimes I like to switch out the bacon for whole eggs or uh, put some avocado on there, Ooh. you know, mm -hmm. switch it up a little bit. Love it. Okay, let's do one more and then we're done. Okay, at Savannah Linderman, what's the importance of veggies in the diet? So it's kind of like, it's such a crazy crazy question and uh, it's like such a great question uh veggies are important it's where you're going to get all of your micronutrients from not all of them but a lot of your micronutrients are going to come from the vegetables that you eat in your diet and that's the kind of stuff that we need to eat to live the healthiest and happiest lives possible so um, vitamin and mineral deficiencies are not good. You want to get a wide variety of different kinds of vegetables in your diet it's also, a great way to stay fuller for longer. You're going to have fiber in there in your vegetables. So it's going to help with digestion. It's going to help with um, cholesterol and blood pressure and all of that stuff that we want to avoid in the future that we don't think we're going to need to avoid when you're in right. your 20s, you know? So um, getting used to incorporating more and more vegetables into your diet is super, super important. It's not just about how much you eat. I mean, how much you eat is very important because I think that's a huge problem in our society today. It's like portions are just way out of control and that's why we have an obesity problem right now. But also the fact that people aren't eating enough vegetables. Like it's going to make you feel better. It's going to help you sleep better. It's going to help you avoid chronic disease um, and people are not eating enough vegetables. I love it. This was some awesome information good thank you for your time anything or what do you want people to know uh where can they find out more about you 
All so what do I want people to know? I want people to know that I want I want I don't think we're gonna change the eight percent to like ten percent, you know, of people that actually follow through on in their the, New Year's in resolutions. The world, you mean? Right. I mean, that's a, like, I don't think our reach is big enough to, to push that I stat. Agree. I would agree. Right? So, but I would love to push it from like eight to eight and a half. Like, maybe we could just bump it to eight and a half. I think we could do that as a collective. Um, I hope that you guys take these strategies and actually implement them to achieve whatever you're feeling super motivated about right now um, and anticipate that motivation running out. So that's, I'll leave you with that. Um, you can also get your goal setting worksheet on the workingagainstgravity.com top of the website it's like the first thing that you're going to see when you're there it's really awesome we put a lot of work into that and there's some good research there to help back up all the things that we're saying here and then of course you can sign up for working against gravity if you want a team of individuals that are 100 percent dedicated to helping you achieve those goals if you don't think that you know if all the past 10 years you haven't you've been part of the 92 percent the past 10 years and you really want to be part of the eight percent uh, I don't have real stats on this, but our community is a large portion of that 8% of people that actually follow through on their New Year's resolutions. So yeah, I think 65% of WAG athletes complete their <laughs> goals. That is, these are fake stats, but... 67% of stats are made up on the spot. Right, exactly. So if you really just want um, somebody to be accountable to, somebody to help you that has been through it before and... Uh, one of my favorite quotes is the fastest path to progress is to learn from other mis others mistakes without having to make them yourself. So I know that my team has seen all the mistakes you can possibly see and has helped people work through them. So uh, if you want to join, sign up, workinghandsgravity.com. Boom. Thank you.